I want to uh, deal tonight in our study of the cults. It's a part of your armor to deal with uh, a couple of secret societies that are quite commonly known, but as with the other cults, not too much is known about them by the average Christians. And the first ones be the Freemasons. Freemasons. <laughs> yeah, well, I wasn't going to say that. <clears throat> but someone's already started, so I'll finish it. They're neither free nor Masons. That's true. They're bound by error, and they're no longer Masons or businessmen. So whoever was trying to be facetious, you were right and didn't know it. <laughs> no, we said the plain truth. Remember when we studied Armstrongism is neither plain nor truth. And Christian science is neither Christian nor scientific. Freemasons, they're neither free nor are they Masons today. And then the other one will be Rosicrucians. Uh, we may get to that this evening. Now, <clears throat> how many of you have heard of the Freemasons, our Masons? And how many of you know people that are members of them? of uh, a lodge, the Masonic ring. That isn't one, but you know, you see them wearing the Masonic ring. Uh, is Freemasonry Christian or non-Christian? Is, uh, should or could a Christian be a Mason? Uh, in good conscience, are there any Christians in the secret lodges? Yes, there are. Christians in them. Some are Christian, I should say. And can a Christian in good conscience be a member of a secret society? No. There may be people here tonight with a Mason's ring on. Uh, it isn't a question of trying to embarrass you, but to uh, enlighten you uh, and trust you'll have the spirit of a brother I met in Tampa, Florida when I was there last time, a year or so ago, speaking that asked me, he had read the occult tract, and someone had told him that uh, masonry secret societies were also a cult, or partook of the occult aspect. And he asked me, uh, he had his mason's ring on, if this was a violation of Christian truth and uh, the will of God, and I said, yes, if you'll take my word for it, it is. Now, if you want to do some study on it, uh, there are a lot of good books in the religious bookstores. You can buy little paperbacks for a quarter or 50 cents. It'll tell you all about the errors of Freemasonry. And I trust you'll have his spirit. He said, Brother Freeman, he said, if I'm in error, I've got, a, I've got little enough time to read what will edify me without picking up something to read that will be negative. He said, I'll take your word for it. Well, now maybe that wouldn't satisfy some people to say, I'll take his word for it. But... Uh, at least it was a good spirit. I didn't even ask him to take my word for it. I told him to do his own study. But it was a right spirit. Now, Freemasonry, and sometimes they're just called Masons. Generally, they are. Uh, Freemasons, or Freemasonry, is, a, is an oath-bound society. Now, right away, those in this church, if they've read the Deeper Life book or been coming very long at all, know that if it's an oath-bound society, that it would be unscriptural to begin with, but it's an oath-bound secret society that was uh, derived from the medieval Middle Ages, in the Middle Ages, the medieval organizations of stonemasons and uh, cathedral builders. You see, back during the Middle Ages especially, uh, you had the rise of these giant cathedrals like Notre Dame in Paris and the building of castles. And most of your cities were just one house, you know, joined to another, made out of stone. And so stone masons, or the craft of stone masonry, <clears throat> was quite, uh, uh, quite proficient and a large craft. And so lodges began to arise. Uh, we could think of them in terms of labor unions, uh, between a labor union, say, and a lodge where you meet for fellowship. Uh, lodges began to arise. Uh, throughout England and Europe, and that's really the background or beginning to stone uh, to Freemasonry, which uh, actually, as we get into it, you'll see is a religious cult, or at least it uh, has religious aspects to it. And in the ritual, there's much to do with uh, uh, the occult and religious uh, symbols and uh, so on. 
Now, it's a worldwide organization that will admit any <clears throat> nationality, person of any nationality, or religion, or creed, or political persuasion. Uh, you don't have to really be anything or believe anything to be a Freemason. Now, can a Christian belong to something like that? You ask yourself this question as you go along. Uh, I, I, sh I, I will say before I finish, but I'd like to say it as I begin, that it's hard for me to conceive how a person could be a Mason because when he goes through the ritual, it ought to alert him to the fact that he's in something that's not of God. Now, the ritual is that obviously unchristian, and I'll say more about that later, but I'd, I'd like to begin by saying that. I don't see how a person could be a Christian. It doesn't speak much for their knowledge of the Bible, to say the least. And I recognize most of you know nothing about Freemasonry, but I'm saying if you got into it and went through the initiation ritual, that ought to alert you that you shouldn't be a part of it. That's what I'm saying. Now, the history of Freemasonry begins not way back in Egypt or Greece or Rome or Palestine where the members of the Masons sometimes think it originated. I had a, a friend uh, when I was in college. He was a uh, deacon in one of the Baptist churches there, a church I attended, and he joined the Masons at the time. And he said, why, Brother Freeman, it's older than Christianity, Masonry is. And, of course, that's what the Masons say because they trace themselves uh, or try to all the way back to Solomon, or Solomon's time. And so he really thought he had something more ancient than Christianity that he was identified with, and he wasn't too interested in church. You know, he never got turned on with the Bible, but he was all enthused over masonry. Of its, it has a lot of religious aspects to it, uh, taken out of various religions, by the way, not just the Bible. So the history of masonry, as I started to say, <clears throat> doesn't go back to ancient times, but goes back to England. And the oldest lodge that kept any records that we have today just goes back to 1701, so that isn't too ancient. Uh, although there were some organizations kind of on the order of lodges in the 14th and 15th centuries in England and Scotland. And that's why you have uh, in masonry, you know, like the Scottish Rite and that sort of thing. Because actually, you can trace the beginnings of masonry in, in, to England. And at the most, you could go back, say, to the 14th and 15th centuries. <clears throat> and these organizations arose just like labor unions arise today uh, to fulfill the kind of a function that uh, a, a person who is a musician or a stonemason or a bricklayer or a carpenter or whatever he is feels uh, that he needs to preserve the uh, secrets of his uh, trade and to preserve uh, the, the uh, discipline and so forth so the standards aren't lowered like the unions uh, insist on and so forth. Uh, now, uh, I don't recommend uh, a person being a member of a labor union or a lodge or anything else. I'm just saying that is why <clears throat> that, that <clears throat> masonry arose. It ro arose for the same reason. You have lodges and uh, 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 unions today for fellowship and for the preservation of the secrets and practices of the trades uh, 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 membership, you know, like watchmakers or mechanics or carpenters, bricklayers. They have certain things they like to pass along to one another, but they don't want you to know anything about. And so legends have grown up about masonry as to its origin. And perhaps the most common one, we won't take time to read it because it's uh, two whole chapters, chapters uh, 5 and 6 of First Kings. The most common legend <clears throat> traces itself back here to Hiram, who built the Temple of Solomon. And you'll find in the ritual of, ritual of masonry, in fact, there are Masonic Bibles that have pictures of Solomon's temple, and uh, they take some of the ritual, you know, from the Old Testament as well as from other sources. <clears throat> but uh, legends grew up, and this was the most common one that said <clears throat> that Hiram was the first mason, or he was the master mason, and that uh, he was murdered because he wouldn't give away the mason secrets. Well, of course, this has absolutely no basis in fact, whatever. Uh, it makes a nice story, but, but the more honest historians in masonry don't attempt to hold anything as ridiculous as that. They go back to the 14th, 15th centuries and say, we're just offshoots from those lodges of stonemasons. 
And uh, you see, that was one of the major crafts during that day. And they were often itinerant. They traveled around from country to country, would stay for years, you see, working on something like Notre Dame. Then they'd move on into other places to build castles and cathedrals and so forth. Now, <clears throat> from that grew up a secret uh, ritual that only the members knew, see, over the centuries, and secret signs to identify one another. Now, Masons, you know, they have certain signs. You can walk into a motel or hotel, and a Mason doesn't have to be wearing a ring, but they, they have ways of uh, making themselves known to other Masons. So it's, a, it's a, quite a secret organization. Uh, in spite of the fact that, as we'll show, the very fact of its secrecy is condemned by Scripture, if you didn't have any other reason, that would be sufficient. Uh, in spite of that fact, yet we've had a lot of prominent Americans, uh, and some of them Christian, of course, not all of them unchristian, who were members or are members of, of this uh, uh, secret society or cult. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, for example was a member of the First Lodge, and we've had 13 of our presidents who were Masons. Nine signers of the Declaration of Independence uh, were Masons. And there are just uh, many, many of the congressmen, senators, and cabinet members, and governors, and uh, representatives of the states and so forth who are Masons today. There are over, <clears throat> over 15,000 lodges just in America, so you can see how big of an organization it is. And they have a lot of political uh, clout, of course, and uh, uh, there's a lot to be said about their power and things that they've been able to achieve or accomplish, at least among their own membership. And there's certain degrees in masonry that you can work toward that we don't want to get into, three basic ones and uh, some higher ones if you want to get into that, and the orders, you see them in the parades, you know, marching. If you've ever wondered who the Shriners were, they're some Knight, Knight Templars, the Scottish Rite, and the Shrine Temple and Women's Orders, and listen to the names of some of these, and that'll tell you the origin of uh, masonry, the Order of the Eastern Star, uh, the Daughters of the Nile, and uh, White Shrine, some of those things. In fact, they trace themselves back try to, to the mystery religions of Egypt. And uh, it's not a, a stonemason's organization anymore. It's made up of businessmen uh, who join it for the advantages they feel it gives them. Well, now, what is the attitude of the Bible <clears throat> towards secret societies? I've, I've always, in my ministry, had a lot of questions from people about secret societies, whether or not they are scriptural, uh, whether or not a Christian could belong to them, and if not, what is wrong with them? What is the scriptural attitude then towards secret societies, which would include Freemasonry? Now, there are a lot of kinds of secret societies, in case you didn't know it, such as secret brotherhoods, uh, secret lodges, secret uh, political organizations, secret religious organizations. There are secret religious organizations. Would you believe that? Secret fraternities and so forth. And so the scriptural attitude toward any secret society is that it is out of harmony with the Word of God because it is a secret organization. I mean, that's the first thing wrong with it. Uh, is... Is it wrong to belong to any kind of a secret society, religious or otherwise? Why, it would be even worse to belong to a religious secret society than a non, or say a political one, because of secrecy. Uh, first of all, secrecy is what characterizes all the false religions, or rather many of the false cults. <clears throat> The mystery religions, if you do any reading in religious history, you'll find that the, all through history there are religions called the mystery religions, and only the initiate, the person who joined it and went through the ritual and was baptized in bull's blood and all of the things that went on in the uh, mystery religions, only they knew the teachings and the rituals and the rites that went on there. But occultism, the very term occult means secret, and the voodoo cults, and Satanism, and Rosicrucianism, and the Ku Klux Klan, and many others. You see, all of these secret organizations, uh, all of these organizations are characterized by their secretiveness. And so the very principle of secretiveness is what condemns uh, masonry or any other secret society 
as being non-Christian because Christianity, and we shouldn't have to say this, but it needs to be emphasized, Christianity is contrary to a secret society is a revelation, an unveiling of truth. And of Jesus Christ, who said, I am the light of the world. Then he said to us, you are the light of the world, John 5. Let your light shine. You see, the very principle of secretiveness condemns Freemasonry or any secret society. Turn with me to John 18 and verse 20 and look at what Jesus said about uh, his society that he was going to, to form, his church and his teaching. In John chapter 18 and verse 20, well, verse 19, the high priest asked Jesus of his disciples and of his teaching, of his doctrine. He said, what is your teaching? The high priest asked Jesus. Now listen to the answer of Jesus. I spake openly to the world. Now compare that with masonry where uh, you ought to hear the threats that are given against anyone who divulges any of their teachings or practices. You ought to hear what, I'll tell you in a moment, what they swear to. Uh, but Jesus said, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret I have said nothing. The very principle of secretiveness is what condemns Freemasonry uh, as a cult and uh, uh, contrary to Christianity and the teachings of Jesus, which are open and light and truth, and to be heralded from the mountaintops, contrary to that, masonry is a secret society with secret ritual, secret initiation, secret signs, secret passwords, and the members have to bind themselves to a, a, an oath of secret, secrecy with all of its dire threats and so forth. And so, <clears throat> contrary to all that Jesus said, I speak openly, I never, never taught in secret, Masonry is characterized by secrecy. I mean, if anything characterizes it's that. And unlike the ritual and the teachings of the secret societies, uh, the truths of Christianity are always openly taught and proclaimed. You see, the Christian rites themselves, like baptism and like feet washing and like the communion of the bread and cup, even, the, even our rituals, our rites, are open proclamations of the gospel. They're not intended to deceive and confuse. Like in masonry, their rites are secret and their signs and all that to confuse and to keep others from knowing. But in Christianity, you see, even the rites that we have uh, in the church are, are open proclamations of the gospel and contrasted to the oath that you have to take in Freemasonry uh, in order to be a member, why Christianity or the Christian is called to give an open public confession of what he believes. He doesn't take any secret oath. There's nothing going on in secret here. I mean, the door is open. Uh, sometimes some people get in. I wish couldn't get in. I, I'll, say that with, I'll say that with all my heart. I wish they couldn't get in. But uh, uh, there's no other way unless you're going to have an exclusive club of 12, 20, 100, 50, or 300 members, whatever you want. I've had people suggest that, but I just said, well, the only problem with that, it isn't Christian. And one brother said, well, we've got our 20 here, and we all agree, and we all believe alike. Let's just close the door. That's enough. We don't need any more. Well, I said, it would be nice uh, uh, to have a little family like that, wouldn't it? <laughs> Call it church, but I said, the only problem is that isn't the way it is. Uh, and so people get in to spy out the land. They get back and they sit and they grimace and growl and, and look at you. And if you weren't under the blood, you'd be scared to death of some, <laughs> some of the people who come into the meetings. They wonder why they come. Of course, I can answer it. The devil sends them to do that very thing. And generally, they're right in front of you. That's right. They won't get over here, over there. And uh, the Lord alerted me that a long time ago and said, don't look at them but once, then preach to those that have come to be taught. Because they can tie up a meeting. But uh, the, the door is open and uh, there's nothing secret. We're not trying to hide anything. And contrasted, as I said, to the oath in Freemasonry, the Christian gives an open public confession uh, to what he believes. If you turn to Matthew 10 and verse 27. Jesus emphasizes this fact. 
Matthew 10 and verse 27. Uh, contrary to the uh, practices of the uh, secret societies and the Masons who have their secret rites and oaths and teachings and doctrines, Matthew 10, 27, look at what Jesus said. What I tell you in darkness, speak ye in the light. Amen. And what you hear in the ear, preach from the housetops. Amen. Just the opposite to secretiveness, you see. There's nothing that you're to hide. Now, I know somebody can always say, what about Jesus' teachings? Don't cast your pearls before swine. Well, let's don't muddy the waters by uh, trying to bring up uh, out of context something else that he said to prove something else. Where people uh, like those, I say sometimes, who get in a meeting who are not there to be blessed or to be a blessing, but there to hinder the meeting, and sometimes in the name of religion, would you believe it? Uh, like people sit on the back row and plead the blood of Jesus against a message, a charismatic message. And uh, they did that, in, and I remember where I was, but I want to tell this uh, while I've got it on my mind. But uh, Coke in his book, and he's uh, well-versed in occultism, but he really fights the baptism and speaking in tongues. And uh, he said uh, that he knows a couple of ministers that got in William Branham's meeting when Branham was over in Germany and sat back there and pleaded the blood against him, you see? Because if you plead the blood and that stops the meeting, uh, if you plead the blood and it's not of God, it will hinder the meeting. Well, Branham, with the word of knowledge, he, he knew everything was going on. And so he just said there are people back there uh, trying to hinder the meeting, you see, by word of knowledge. And so Coke took that to mean that uh, if, it had, if Branham had been of God, it wouldn't have bothered him, wouldn't have disturbed him. But it was an operation, the word of knowledge, which he knows nothing about. Um, so I said I wouldn't forget what I started out to say, and uh, it seems like it did, but that's all right. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'd rather told you about Branham anyway than what I said. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Now, a second, uh, second reason why secret societies are not of God, uh, aside from the fact of their secretiveness, is because of their religious mixture. Now, there's a big word for it. I use it in my book, Religious Syncretism. But syncretism means a union or a mixture of different religious beliefs. And that's certainly what characterizes the Freemasons. They say they're not a religion, but listen, it's filled with religious teaching and religious beliefs out of all sorts of, of uh, Egyptian mystery religions and uh, medieval mysticism and Rosicrucian teachings and others. And so... Uh, Freemasonry is to be condemned because of its religious mixture of doctrine and teaching. And the term occult, you won't read very long in Masonry until you run across the term occult frequently. It's freely used in their ritual. And you find a lot of occult belief and teaching, occult lore, L-O-R-E, throughout uh, uh, Freemasonry. A third... <clears throat> Third reason why Freemasonry is unscriptural and a Christian should not be a part of it, a member of it, is because of the Masonic Oath with its gruesome uh, threats against anyone who divulges the secrets. The Masonic Oath uh, violates the scriptural prohibition against taking the oath in any form for any reasons. Now, the candidate in Masonry and as I say, I don't see how a Christian could ever get this far and then continue if he were a Christian, and yet I know it does happen because I know some Masons. Uh, I did know some Masons who I knew were Christian. But in this oath, they swear that if they divulge any of the secrets, now here's one of the things they swear to. I have it written down. They swear that they will, they will submit to having their throat cut across, their tongue torn out, and be buried in the sand of the sea at, high, at low water mark. Uh, <laughs> that's, now, that's just mild compared to what goes on in masonry as far as the ritual and the oaths and so forth that you have to swear to. Besides the fact that the scriptures, Jesus and the scriptures, condemn taking the oath for any reason. Now, we're not talking about Old Testament under law there's a reason why they took the oath, and we have that on the tape on the teachings of the Ten Commandments. 
that they were swearing by everything. And so God, when he created the nation of Israel, said, take all your oaths by my name. And that was to wean them away from their idolatry, swearing by the other gods and all that. And he was getting these spiritual babies, getting all of their attention, whatever they did, onto him. Then when we come to the New Testament teaching, we have what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, he didn't condemn what the Old Testament taught because he came to fulfill it. But he does say, <clears throat> and pointing back to the Old Testament practice of swearing, he does say in Matthew 5 and verse 33, again, you've heard that it has been said of them in old times, speaking of, of course, the Old Testament, that thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But now listen to the full revelation for his disciples. Are you his disciple? Then it's plain. I say unto you, Jesus said, swear not at all. Now he didn't say at all except on a Bible in court. He says not at all. He didn't say except when you close a deal uh, with a lawyer and uh, there's a paragraph down there. Do you swear that the aforesaid paragraphs and statements are true? No, he says swear not at all. Neither by heaven, that would be the Bible, or God's throne, nor by earth, for it's his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, yes and no. For whatsoever is more than this comes of the devil, the evil one. You can't make it any plainer than that. And you cannot justify taking an oath. And if you've got any problems about it, then it's dealt with in our book, Deeper Life in the Spirit. When I say if you have any problems, I mean if you don't understand that we can't uh, teach the same things over and over and over, and we've already taught on this. And so for those of you who have not had any teaching on the oath, it's in our book, Deeper Life in the Spirit, chapter 4. It's also forbidden in the book of James, chapter 5 and verse 12. Now you've got two places in Scripture where the oath is forbidden. Uh, James 5, verse 12, but above all things. Now, that, that is always in Scripture a, a, a technical term to mean that it's important that you obey this. So they say, above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath. That includes the Bible in court, the one that Christians are always trying to excuse themselves on and try to find proof texts where Paul took an oath or something like that, uh, which uh, is ridiculous. Or said, well, God swears. Well, uh, God couldn't find anyone uh, greater to swear by, so he swore by himself. Well, dear friend, <clears throat> what a perfect, holy, and righteous God does is one thing, and what we do, I think, is another. And if it wouldn't matter what he did, he tells us not to. That's plain enough. I don't have to figure out always all the logical conclusions. I wouldn't have to memorize the Bible if I find a prohibition to me or a command to do. That's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. I don't have to. You know, there were times when I couldn't answer every question asked me when I first got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but I knew one thing. I had received it, and I, I was speaking in tongues. It didn't matter that you met people that said it's not for today. Uh, <laughs> I had Acts 2 working for me. So what did 1 Corinthians 12, 13 mean? It really didn't matter at that stage because I had the baptism and was speaking in tongues. Because whatever it meant, it wouldn't contradict what Acts 2 said and what I'd gotten. So he says, swear neither by heaven, neither by earth, nor any other oath, but let your nay mean nay. Yea. Let your yea mean yea. Let your nay mean nay. Lest you fall into condemnation. Who's going to condemn you? God. Because he forbids it twice. Now no one can ever have heard that. I read both those from scripture. There's no interpretation to what I said. I just read you the passages. No Christian could ever hear those two passages quoted and ever take an oath again with, in good conscience. Because no oath is allowed in Scripture. Well, uh, as I say, there's more teaching on it in the Deeper Life book, but we're, 
we're raising the question about secret societies and the oath in Freemasonry is the crucial thing, uh, uh, the key to the whole business. Uh, and it has dire threats if you violate it of allowing yourself to be uh, tortured and put to death. But all oaths in Scripture, as I said, are forbidden, and an honest reading of those two texts would uh, show any Christian that. You really couldn't debate it. See, an oath is the unnecessary affirmation to the word of a Christian. It's just unnecessary. Amen. Uh, uh, to, to take an oath on a Bible or anything else as a Christian implies you, would, you could have told a lie if you hadn't uh, forswearing yourself that you wouldn't lie, which is a contradiction for a Christian. The best testimony you can give. Let them laugh. Oh, sometimes they will. But the testimony, best testimony you can give is that I'm a Christian. My yes will mean yes, and my no will mean no. As far as I know what I'm telling you is truth, when I say yes, ask me a question, it'll mean yes. That's what he said in two places there. Let your yes mean yes. Let your no mean no. Don't make it shady or gray. Say, well, maybe or perhaps tell it like it is and... Uh, don't take the oath, which is unnecessary for a Christian. You see, it is necessary for non-Christians. I don't care if they use it in court for non-Christians. They need it, although it really doesn't help most of the time. Because <laughs> you read every day in the paper people being uh, sent to jail for perjury, and perjury is taking an oath, is, is telling an untruth under oath, or it isn't perjury. You can lie all you want up and down the aisles in court until you take the oath. Then it's perjury. And so they need it. And it helps sometimes, I guess. But uh, a Christian doesn't need it. And so, secret societies are condemned because of the oath, Freemasonry especially. Uh, fourth reason why is membership in Freemasonry violates the scriptural prohibition against unequally yoking yourself with unbelievers. First Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 forbids this. Uh, Chapter 6 and verse 14. Can you be a member of a secret society, Freemasonry? God says no, because Freemasonry is made up of unbelievers, friends, of every religious persuasion imaginable, and some with no religious persuasion. Yes, some are Christians, but that's why we are saying what we're saying, that they should not be a part of it. Second Corinthians 6 and verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So it's plain enough in Scripture that we cannot unite ourselves with unbelieving business partners, unbelieving wives, unbelieving husbands, unbelieving uh, whatever relationship lodges clubs. A good reason why you should not be a member of a labor union. Uh, if you have to feel you have to go that route, use your faith and God will give you a better job than you had. Nobody in our church I ever knew of. Now, of course, the church just keeps growing and growing. But, but during those early years, you see, when one brother wanted to close the door, 20 was enough, and we didn't need any more. Uh, uh, some of them, to get jobs, you know, they, they came to me and said, what should I do because I have to join the union? Well, I said, you know, you really know by asking me. They wouldn't be asking me if they didn't know. They shouldn't. But they, I recognize people sometimes need a little motivation, a little push. And uh, I said, no, you don't have to worry about it. Just uh, ask God to give you a job where there are no unions. Uh, if not, I wouldn't need any other reason not to be a member of a union than the striking and resistance against the authority, the police, the employer, and all of that. You see, these are the deeper life teachings in our fourth chapter in the Deeper Life book, dear friends. Uh, you know what advice John the Baptist gave to those who wanted to be followers of Jesus, of the Messiah to come. You see the soldiers and the people and the priests and various ones said, now what, was me, what must we do? And each of the groups would ask, what was, must we do? And he would tell them. And when he got to the soldiers, he said, don't use any violence and be content with your wages. 
Now they had the power to do something about it. So he said to the soldiers, no striking, be content with your wages. Friends, it's been in the Bible all along. I don't know why Brother Freeman or somebody else has to come along and try to convince Christians I never had to be told it was wrong to be in a union. And I don't feel I'm that much smarter than anybody. It, there's just something in me that, that, that I get a check in my spirit because of the force and violence and the lashing out verbally all the time against the authorities. I didn't believe in, in being a part of that before I was a Christian. I've got, I'll share that with you. So it didn't, uh, I wasn't even regenerate and I saw the evil in, and don't misunderstand, there, there was, there's plenty of evil in the uh, management end. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying for a Christian, he is to be submissive. And if you've ever met Jesus and read the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings of the New Testament, you'll find one message. One of the apostles was called Simon the Zealot. That was a political party, the Zealots. And they really agitated for their rights. But when he became an apostle, you never hear any more about Simon the Zealot being filled with zeal to go out and agitate against people who didn't agree with him. None of the twelve ever resisted authority. They obeyed the Lord and submitted to the penalty. Amen. They said to Peter, don't preach. Peter went right on, preached, and then he turned. He gave him his back while they, while they gave him 40 stripes. And uh, time and again, you see this. It's, a, it's just, uh, if you'll excuse the expression, a whole nother realm that we're talking about. Amen. 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 That the average Christian doesn't even know exists. Uh, it's, it's pathetic. It's pathetic. The, the big eyes and the questionable looks you get as you go about and minister when you just make some of these basic elementary truths. I didn't have to have anyone tell me when I uh, was converted and still in business and needed the money. I was going bankrupt and claimed God's promise that I wouldn't and then have Christians, professing Christians, who were cheating me out of money. They'd come in and buy things and then not pay. And, uh, and uh, praise God, I'd gotten, just gotten saved and claimed I wouldn't go bankrupt, claim Matthew 6.33. And when they would do that, I would rejoice because that's what the Bible said to do. And my dear Baptist friends thought I'd lost my mind. Oh, you'll be all right when you get your feet on the ground. You've just gotten converted. <laughs> well, praise God, I've never gotten my feet on the ground <laughs> because... People are still taking advantage of me. They have, and praise God for it, because that's what he says to do. When they take your coat, give them their, your cloak also. If they borrow your goods, don't ask them again. So I never asked them for it. I didn't. Now, before that, I had ways of getting it, I, or at least trying. Uh, one of the uh, customers was a deputy sheriff, and... Uh, I had ways, but after I was converted, no. In fact, I saw the son of a man who owed me money saved in my Sunday school class right after I got converted. And the whole family touched because uh, before I was converted, I kept dunning them for the money they owed me. You know, they'd pay just enough to keep you from taking them to court. <laughs> uh, they had ways. I guess it did everybody that way. Some people live on other people's capital. But... Uh, after I got converted, I no longer tried to get any money from them. Praise the Lord. It was a whole nother realm that I was translated into. Well, that, all of that for why I wouldn't be a part of a trade union uh, for all those reasons. But Freemasonry, as I say, uh, like with the labor union, you're, you're yoking yourself with unbelievers. And you're to have membership in nothing but the body of Christ. And that isn't held by a church letter anyway, but by your f confession of faith in Christ. If you're a Christian, you're a part of the body. If you're here worshiping tonight, you're a part of this body. That's why you don't want to do anything to hinder it. Amen. Like not even go to sleep. That would hinder the body. <laughs> right. And where you are next week, you're a part of the body of Christ there. Amen. But Freemasonry states that it's not a religion. Therefore, they say one's religions, religious beliefs do not matter. And so they admit to their membership 
Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Unitarians, Jehovah's Witness, and so on. It just wouldn't matter because they say all religions are different paths to the same goal, God. Well, now I think if you've ever read the book of John, you know the answer to that. Jesus himself in John 14, 6 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man comes to the Father except through me. That's plain enough. And Freemasonry teaches, and it's plain in all of their histories and, and books. You won't read long until you run into the requirements for membership. All you have to acknowledge, I believe in a supreme being. Now, <clears throat> that just is one notch from atheism, you know. Uh, it hasn't improved at all in my estimation, but <clears throat> you have to believe in a supreme being. And you can come in as a Hindu and say, I believe in many gods, and you'll be accepted. You can come in and say, I believe as uh, Christian science does in divine mind, that's God, impersonal God, you'll be accepted. You can come in as a Christian and they don't come in this way and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, but if you did, they would accept you. They would rather you come in though and say you believe in God so you wouldn't offend some of the Hindus or some of those that are not sure what they believe. <laughs> But the membership of Freemasonry is not Christian. There are Christians in it, but it's not Christians. And the scriptures condemn membership uh, or union with anyone for any reason who is not a Christian. Now, this does not mean you can't do business with them or you can't have uh, 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 free social uh, identification, that sort of thing, at a business level and a personal level, like your neighbor and that sort of thing, but not to yoke yourself with them. You know, Paul said to the church in Corinth, I told you previously not to company with fornicators. But he said, I don't mean that absolutely, or else you'd have to be translated, you know, taken out of the world, because he said the world's full of fornicators. But he says, what I mean is not to company with them, not to eat with them, and not to fellowship with them. Now, again, he isn't setting up a rule because some fornicators would never be won to Christ if you didn't eat in fellowship with them. But don't use that to run to the bar and drink your beer and play your cards and let them beat you at poker so they can be told about Jesus. That's a contradiction. But I think God expects us to use common sense. But it isn't, it's interesting, it isn't uncommon for a man, if he gets converted as a mason, to give up masonry. He sees the contradiction. This happens all the time. When I say all the time, I mean it's, it's, a, it's not just a rare thing that when a man gets converted to Christ, gets saved, he sees the contradiction right away. He gives it up. And as I say, uh, there are Christians in it, but it doesn't say much for their understanding of the Word of God. Unequally yoked, secretiveness, and uh, the religious mixture of you believe what you want just as long as you say you believe in a divine intelligence somewhere and that sort of thing. And especially when they bound themselves to that terrible oath they have to take in the ritual of uh, violence and uh, swearing themselves to uh, be allowed to be, have their throats slit and all of that, that should have given away the fact this wasn't Christian right away. Well, praise the Lord for the light God gives us. Now, how many of you have heard of the Rosicrucians? Well, that's probably most of you. Uh, most of the literature, uh, paperback pulp literature you can pick up off your newsstands, will have a Rosicrucian ad on the back cover, if you look carefully. Now, the Rosicrucian order is a secret cult. They, like the Freemasons, claim they're not religious. And uh, sometimes they go under the, you'll see this, on literature or something, A-M-O-R-C, you'll see that and they won't tell you they're Rosicrucians. And they'll hand you a tract or you'll find a tract in a uh, tract uh, cabinet on a wall somewhere and just be A-M-O-R-C. But that's the ancient and mystical order of the Rosicrucians, uh, Rosicrucianism. A-M-O-R-C. And that'll alert you to what you're reading. And sometimes it'll sound, you know, very humanitarian and religious sometimes and generally in, appear to be, try to be intellectual. But A-M-O-R-C is the Rosicrucian order. Now the term supposedly comes from two Latin words, the Rosicrucian from Rosa, which is Latin word for rose, and crux, 
the word for cross. And sometimes it's called the Order of the Rosy Cross. And you'll see the cross, uh, you'll see the cross in Rosicrucianism quite, quite frequently. In fact, that's their symbol, is the cross, with a rose on it. Their cross in Rosicrucianism is a, is a mystical symbol of the evolutionary progress of man. See, it doesn't even have anything to do with Jesus' blood and death, which they don't believe in anyway. So when you see the cross, you know, Jesus the Rose of Sharon, don't you confuse those things with our cross. In fact, the cross is sometimes found in pagan culture, in their uh, ritual. You see, the cross is not exclusively a Christian symbol. What makes it important is that there's nobody on it. No. You see, it was the Roman method, important for us, uh, that there's no one on it. The Roman method of uh, crucifying criminals was on a cross, or killing criminals was crucifixion on a cross. And uh, pagan cultures have all sorts of symbols, and so the cross is found in other cultures. And so it isn't exclusively Christian, but it means something to the Christian when you use the name Jesus Christ. That's why just talking of the cross, like Mormons do, or the blood even, are of crucifixion. Ask them, what do you mean by these terms? Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, if to get you off guard, will speak of Jesus as the Son of God. Do you then what you need to say, do you mean divine Son of God came from heaven down here, Son of God, eternal, and uh, was born uh, the Christ as Jesus? Or they'll say, no, he was adopted at his baptism by the Father, and uh, he became a Son of God like we become sons of God if we follow his example, you see. And this is what they mean. So you, a lot of people uh, will you know, want to know about these things. And you'd be surprised how often people are deluded. I have questions frequently about Latter-day Saints and some of these groups, like Christian Science. Well, they say, just like you, Brother Freeman, that uh, uh, if you don't think the negative thought, if you don't confess you're sick, then you won't be. Well, you have to show them the difference between mind healing, mental healing, mental suggestion, which Christian science teaches, and a positive confession of a promise of God. There's a big difference. Telling myself I'm not sick will not heal me. But, telling my, but, but confessing to myself and to the devil and to you that by Jesus' stripes I was healed at Calvary is quite another thing. And so uh, the cross, as I say, and the rose, while they mean something to the Christian, do not mean the same things at all to Rosicrucians. Uh, and if you read some of their ads, they say, now great truths are dangerous in the hands of a person who doesn't know how to handle them. And then right away, before you read any farther, that appeals to your intellect. Great truths are dangerous <clears throat> to some individuals, the ads will read, but to those who know how to treat precious truths and handle them, then the ancient wisdom of the Rosicrucians will enable you to understand your cosmic relationship to the divine intelligence and help you overcome all of your problems and give you success in business or marriage relationships and uh, <clears throat> help you achieve all your desired potentials. What would you really like to be? Join the Rosicrucian order and through the wisdom of the ages we'll show you how it's done. Well, although, like Freemasons, uh, the Rosicrucians don't claim to be a religious order, it's just uh, filled with religious concepts and teaching and doctrine. It's taken, their teachings are taken from Judaism, the Old Testament, taken from Christianity. Now, I don't mean <clears throat> they take them in their proper sense, but they mix them up. You know, they take something out here and out there that they want out of Judaism, out of Christianity, out of mythology, out of Hinduism, out of Buddhism, out of spiritism, out of occultism, out of pagan philosophies, and it's the biggest complex mess you've ever, <laughs> it really is. The Rosicrucian teachings are the most complicated uh, mixture, worse than what you find in Freemasonry that I've ever run into. Now. They claim to trace themselves back to ancient Egypt and the mystery religions back there. They make no bones about that. They want to be known as uh, having their origin from the ancient mystery religions. But actually, you can trace the beginning of Rosicrucianism 
to the 17th century and an anonymous document that began to be circulated, I'm persuaded, as a put-on. Somebody uh, writes something anonymously or <laughs> sign another name. Uh, well, like some of the, uh, it's called the pseudepigrapha, some of the uh, early attempts to write gospels that were not inspired. You've got all sorts of gospels, like the Gospel of the Twelve Apostles, and the Gospel of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all sorts of documents, and they put names on them of well-known people, like Mary, are the apostles, uh, the gospel of Peter, and that sort of thing, to authenticate it. Well, uh, the Rosicrucians have their beginning in the 17th century to the rise of an anonymous document written by, we don't know who, as I say, I think was a put on, and said that they had uncovered, discovered the tomb of a person named Christian Rosenkreutz, <laughs> No relationship to Rosicrucians, but his name was Rosen, R-O-S-E-N-K-R-E-U-T-Z. Uh, <clears throat> they discovered the tomb of Christian Rosenkreutz, and he was the founder of Rosicrucianism, and he named it Rosa Crux, which is uh, the Rosy Cross, the Order of the Rosy Cross, but it's not related to his name. It just sounds familiar, similar. And uh, as this document said, and it began to be circulated all through Europe, that uh, Christian Rosencruz uh, was an adept who was a great occult master who knew magic and philosophy, and that he'd studied under the wise men of the Near East, and they had taught him all of the ancient truths of the world and the universe, and that Rosencruz came back to Germany, where he'd been born, and uh, founded the order of Rosicrucianism with seven other members, the secret order, and they all agreed they had never divulged the secrets. But then the document said they had found his tomb with all of these secret documents in it, you know, telling about the Rosicrucian order. And the circulation of this anonymous letter throughout Europe, this anonymous document, invited all the intellectual, the intellectuals, men or women, to join in forming Rosicrucian orders all over Europe, which actually happened. You know, some people, I think, took it as a put-on and did it, and some really believed. You know, people are always wanting to believe something besides the Bible. And uh, so this is where it arose in the 17th century through an anonymous document that really has no basis in fact anyway, because Christian Rosencruz is just a figment of somebody's imagination anyway. He never existed. And... Uh, we don't have any record of a, of a Rosicrucian order, uh, actually as far as they, where they kept records, before about 100 years ago. So it doesn't go way back to ancient Egypt and all that. They try to trace themselves way back like the Freemasons and say all of the wise men, Jesus, Socrates, and they name all the wise men. Uh, who was the fellow, the apple fell on his head? Um, Newton. Newton. All the wise men were Rosicrucians and belong to the secret order, and all of their wisdom is available to you if you'll just join. Well, actually, as I say, you can trace it back to an anonymous document of the 17th century, and uh, the oldest order, uh, club, or lodge, or whatever you want to call it, was in 1866, which isn't too old, as you see. And Rosicrucianism had quite an influence, by the way, on Freemasonry. You find their teachings in the, among the Freemasons. And it was not until 1915 that a businessman by the name of H.S. Lewis brought the cult over to America and it was founded here. Well, as a result of that, uh, a lot of people belong to it. Not, not so many, if you consider worldwide, there are probably not over 100,000 actual members, but it has quite an influence and outreach and most people have heard about it. And whether or not they met their members or studying the literature in their home. They wouldn't necessarily attend a lodge meeting to be taught or something, but uh, there are probably a whole lot of people that, that don't know it's a cult who get their literature, send for it, it's free of course, and uh, to get some of this wisdom to overcome all of their problems and so forth. Now, in conclusion, I'm not going to give you the scriptural answers to their errors. I just want to mention what the Rosicrucians believe that I got out of their literature. Uh, and the reason I'm not answering it is because I've already answered it under Christian science and uh, those other cults we studied and Freemasonry, and I will be answering it under other things, like uh, assuming we'll study some more of the cults, uh, 
uh, I'll be answering uh, from Scripture what they believe. But here's some of the things they believe. Reincarnation. This is what they teach. Reincarnation. Pantheism. You know, pantheism. God is the world and the world is God. That there's nothing that exists that isn't God. That a rock is God. Tree is God. A frog is God. You're God. We're God. You see, God is us. In other words, creation is the uh, outworking of God. He has to create. This is his nature, pantheism. That nature is a visible symbol of God. Uh, evolution is taught. Occultism of all forms. The divinity of man. I've already said that, that we're God. Mythology. They teach mythology. They deny man's individual soul. That uh, there is but one soul, and that's God. A denial of the existence of evil spirits. For some reason, they've taken off on that and call it nothing but superstition. They have spent a lot of time denying evil spirits. A denial that Jesus and the Christ are the same. Now that keeps cropping up in all the cults. I've noticed that over the years as I've studied the cults, you find it in things that you might not call cults, like neo-orthodoxy. If there's any college or seminary students here, they'll recognize that name. Uh, a, a distinction they try to make between Jesus and the Christ. They say that Jesus partook of the Christ spirit and the Christ spirit is in every man and just to a higher degree in him. It was in Socrates and in Moses and so forth. And uh, every now and then the Christ spirit comes forth in a great leader and he becomes, he founds a new religion. And so Jesus and the Christ are not the same and then they uh, repudiate the existence or reality of evil. There is no such thing as evil because even an earthquake or a flood or a bomb going off is God working in his creative evolutionary process that even in destruction he's creating. That is to say he has to destroy some things to make evolution work right. And so these are some of the basic teachings of the Rosicrucians. And as I say, like the Freemasons, they invite anybody to join. doesn't matter what you believe. A uh, Muslim, a Jew, a Christian, uh, an atheist, what have you, can be a part of the Rosicrucian order. Now, of course, there are all kinds of secret societies, but these are two of the most common ones that Christians somehow seem to get uh, mixed up in and deluded with, about, or by.